Today on Built to Last, oh. something fishy is going on. She got a 19-inch bass. Swinging for the fences. You've really have six months to get this ready. And all aboard. I never imagined I would have a job <laughs> as good as this. Put down that remote and pick up a hammer. It's time for Built to Last. Built to Last is brought to you by the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Labor and Management Committee and the Boy Scouts of America Pathway to Adventure Council. Welcome to Built to Last, I'm Mark Nelson. And I'm Monica Peterson, and we're here at the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Apprentice and Training Center, where the hands that build America are learning their craft. The apprentices who train here don't just go on to build towering skyscrapers or create intricate and beautiful woodwork, they keep the trains running too. Chicago Transit Authority elevated lines have a long history in Chicago and the Chicago Loop is famous around the world. Here are views of the famous Loop, taken in 1901. The lines were built a century ago when the downtown area hit its peak in pedestrian traffic. The branches of the elevated system we travel today have stood the test of time, in part due to some unsung heroes who work hard to keep it renewed. A lot of passengers don't realize what goes into just making a footwalk or a platform or even a station how safe for them to enter. There's, uh, there's so much behind the scenes stuff that, that takes place. It's just the logistics of getting the job done that you know the average person doesn't really think about. That begins at the 77th Street South Shop Lumberyard. We're standing right now, this is our sawmill out of the South Shops complex. This is where we cut all the heavy timbers and all treated material for our platforms. They're constantly cutting material to size. We band it up and we ship it out to the job. So that's a daily job for John and his partner. Usually he has Roberto with him. This place is where we store all our lumber that comes from the lower yard. Therefore, we have it on site when we get ready to prep our various jobs. So at any given time, it might be 2,000 to 3,000 pieces of two by six uh, treated material for the platform decks. Well, historically, uh, we've always used creosote uh, lumber, uh, specifically for railroad. Creosote has a 20, 25 year uh, lifespan due to the fact that Creo is oil based. A lot of our clients or John Q. Public or customers don't like the sticky Creo or the smell that they take home with them. In recent history, they started using treated lumber. It has the same characteristics of Creole as far as longevity is concerned, but not the smell and the other maintenance that goes along with Creole. That stuff we're cutting today, that'll be used at 43rd Street on the Green Line. We're gonna be replacing the platform. We're starting on the inbound platform. That's where all of that material will be used. Ready, break. <laughs> Go turn the sign around. <laughs> <laughs> we deliver to the work train at our lower yard on 63rd Street. They load it on the train, we tell them where to put it, and then they roll out here at night and they drop it off for us. A platform typically is 450 feet long. Uh, they, they average 8 to 10 feet deep. Once we get all the tactile off, then we're going to start tearing up the deck. We tore out a 16-foot section of the deck. We tore the decking out and all the support joists. And we're in the process of putting it back with all new material. We try to prep the jobs under ideal conditions. Therefore, the lumber that we put in today at uh, 16 feet, we cut that down to 8 feet, even though the platform is smaller than that. That way we can actually finish cut the boards based upon the width of the train out in the field and we're gonna do the entire station, new tactile. These are for the, the vision impaired, new footwalks. We actually uh, start out with 16 foot uh, two by six Creo, and we cut that into 30 inch footwalk boards. And the footwalk is adjacent to the third rail. If the train should, for some reason, cease to run, that footwalk has to be there for the passengers to walk off the train. They, in essence, can get on the footwalk and walk to the next station for their safety. And then, as you can see down here, the footwalk continues through the whole entire system. 
when you're up on the elevated, you always have to be conscious of your surroundings. If there's a train coming, you'll hear the flagman let us know a train's coming. You stop working and you face the train. So the motorman knows that you see him. Yeah, you, you have to stay alert constantly. It is the key out here because my safety depends on everybody else and vice versa. You know, we have to, if I see a train and somebody don't, if I see a, a dangerous condition, I have to warn them. We, have to, we talk to each other constantly. It becomes uh, a brotherhood. I mean, in certain instances, depending upon what you may be doing, it's almost like a family. That's why it's called a brotherhood. We've been together for years. We've been together for years, and everybody gets along. We help each other. And all our trades here are excellent craftsmen. People see what we do, so we have, we have to make sure that we do it right. And the only way you're going to do it right is by the training we get from our apprenticeship program. And a lot of guys have uh, a lot of advanced skills here. I put a couple of the younger guys with a couple of the older guys, and they have skills that we didn't have. If a carpenter comes here, this is a whole different environment. But if they have their, their carpenter skills, they pick it up in no time. It's, it's, uh, it's different. Railroad, Mr. John. Well, what's funny is I used to live not too far from the CTA station. And if we were driving somewhere with my father and the gates would go down, I'd tell my mother, I'm gonna work there someday. I like that, you know, and here I am. <laughs> but unbeknownst to me, I didn't even know CTA had carpenters until my father-in-law told me. You know, when we started and we would get on a platform crew, we would go from platform to platform. And we stayed on there, you know. Myself, John, Brian, these guys that started with us. Very few people in life actually get opportunity to uh, make money at what they enjoy doing. I mean, it's just a great place to work and a great bunch of guys. I'd never imagine I'd be working for a transit company. I'd never imagine I would have a job <laughs> as good as this. A lot of this project is not visible to the naked eye. A large amount of it is structural. Underneath what you see at the ballpark is a huge, massive structural project. You, t you would have told me five years ago that we would have had oh, close to a thousand people on the street doing good things for the community. I would have said, I don't know where we're going to get them from. This is all about changing stuff in the neighborhood where people don't have the wherewithal or the financial resources to do something. A lot of times you're going to see somebody actually break down in tears. The press doesn't cover this. This is something we do because it's the right thing to do. IBEW Local 134. We give back to the communities where we live and to those who need it most. Every boy needs a foundation. A foundation he can stand on. To embrace opportunity. To overcome obstacles. Because this is the time to equip a boy with what he needs for where he's going. And where he's going is anywhere he wants. Keeping restaurants and hotels up to date with the latest design trends is a constant challenge. Finding qualified contractors isn't at finishingchicago.com. We work with top designers and general contractors who use the latest painting, drywall finishing, and wall covering techniques in Chicagoland's premier hotels and restaurants. The hospitality industry relies on finishingchicago.com as its free resource to find quality finishing contractors. For a great finish, start with finishingchicago.com. Building on the foundation of a championship, the Chicago Cubs are making the most storied ballpark in America even more special. We believe that every project we build is a place where something special happens, and Wrigley Field is an amazing example of that. When we first got the news that we had won this job, we knew it was something that was magical for our company. We were working out on the field and just think of the players that walked out onto that field, uh, uh, from Babe Ruth to Ernie Banks and everybody else, and, and then our today's players. I mean, it's great to be part of it. Wrigley Field is getting a makeover, a multi-year project that will restore virtually everything. This is a huge project, and it would not happen without the help and, and support and active participation of every trade. Plumbers, electricians, carpenters, all of them, operators, laborers, we all pull together, we all get it done. 
Every fall at the end of baseball season, construction springs to life and a mad race begins. The carpenters have participated in a wide range of activities here. Everything from um, the, the piling that you see happening to the rough carpentry, to even um, making the bleachers happen on time. They prefabricated the formwork for that and they actually took the ivy off the wall and laid it down on the field, covered it up with some protection, and then the workers were working on top of that. As fall becomes winter, Clark and Waveland transform. And in almost no time, it's time to prepare for the new season. The reality is, is you really have six months to get this ready. It's such a short time frame uh, when they stop playing baseball, when we start and finish our construction, everything has to be ready for opening day. Opening day doesn't change. That day is in stone. It's, it's utterly amazing. I've got some close friends who are carpenters, and uh, they talked to me through what it did take to get some of the things done. And in the middle of all this hard work, the Cubs finally broke the curse and won the championship. After the season ended, it was back to work. Just seeing the construction in the off season, because I come here in the off season as well, just seeing all the hard work, all the labor that it takes to to go into doing the upgrades. A lot of this project is not visible to the naked eye. A large amount of it is structural. So underneath what you see and experience at the ballpark is a huge, massive structural project. And below ground, not only are there new club facilities and bunker seats, the construction is finished on the American Airlines 1914 Club. So to dig 20 feet underground below adjacent footings, you have to hold that up so everything doesn't come down in the hole with you. By pile driving, some of the weight of the stands can be transferred and distributed into the middle of the field. Vibratory hammers that we've brought, they have a special high frequency variable moment part so the vibrations will help get the sheet pile on the ground but won't damage adjacent structures. Pile driving takes skill and experience and these highly trained professionals must be precise and safe while adhering to their strict deadline. Matter of fact, on this job right now in that hole, we have two third generation pile drivers, a fourth generation pile driver, you know, whose great grandfather retired from Thatcher. It's a great accomplishment when you get done at the end of the day and you can look back and see what you kind of built. I'm very impressed because I, I passed around here, I worked around the corner and I passed here around a couple of weeks, like two weeks ago, and I saw the, all the construction they had, and I was just thinking to myself, I think this will be impossible to have this ready. Being out here and being a, being a part of, of helping this ballpark uh, survive for another 100 years uh, is, is, is great. I never miss opening day, no matter what the weather conditions are. What a great way to celebrate, but with snow, you gotta love it, right? I woke up extra early, super excited, almost like a kid on Christmas day. Every time I come here, something is new and better and bigger. You, you feel more welcoming to the stadium. You feel more relaxed. The changing around here has been pretty constant, and it's impressive, and it's nice, and it's clean. It's so nice to know that um, they're putting money and time into the stadium. Making it more state-of-the-art, more modern. I have Wi-Fi and all the upgrades that they're doing while still keeping that classic feel. Yeah, a lot of hard work, a lot of sweat. A lot of talent out there. Baseball, hot dogs, and unions, right? <laughs> the famous ivy of Wrigley Field's outfield wall was planted in 1937. And if the ball gets stuck in there, the batter is awarded a double. When these fish come up, it is a good feeling to see the smile on the face of a child. For that moment, nothing else matters. That is what these kind of events are for. When you need a concrete contractor for your commercial project, you can't waste time waiting through countless unproven contractors who don't specialize in the job type you need or service your area. ConcreteIL.com lets you browse Northern Illinois' top contractors to find the perfect fit for your exact needs. You can filter our vetted list of contractors by both job type and location, and even request proposals directly through the site. Thinking commercial concrete? Think ConcreteIL.com. 
At Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions, we take great pride in making a positive difference in the lives of people. With the broadest portfolio in the industry and the technical performance to back it up, you can design and install with confidence. Our ceiling construction expertise, training, and pre-engineered ceiling solutions make it easy for you to seamlessly transition from one end of the building to the other. Improve construction efficiencies and keep every job on time, on budget, and on the mark with Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions. Faster, easier, better. Welcome back to Built to Last. Our next story takes us to the shores of South Ridge Lake in Illinois, where a group of carpenters are bringing the joy of fishing to the local community. We were at the Hoffman Estates Fishing Derby. Uh, it's been going on for 20 plus years, and uh, we're having a derby mainly for the kids. Different businesses, including Chicago Regional Council Carpenters, buys fish and they tag them and there's prize money. Our Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters always sponsor the $120 fish for us and all the fish are assigned a number. So when the lucky fisher person catches that fish, they win the associated amount of money. The Chamber of Commerce is so heavily involved in this fishing derby. I think they do a lot of the, um, the behind the scenes stuff. We go to work when we get on site. So you're going to have the Chamber of Commerce, you're going to have Carpenters Local 839, you're going to have businesses from the area, the police department. So the Derby part, it, to me, is secondary to the fact to come out, have a fun afternoon, and hopefully you catch a fish. And we're a part of that as an organization, which the Chicago Regional Council participates. He showed me how to throw the cast and like how to fish and like how to wait. And it's like, it's really fun when I like fish. I've learned that you have to be patient to get what you want. You do it like this, and then when you're doing that, you let go of the button, and then it flies. Definitely think places like this uh, need to be protected. I think kids need to be exposed to these uh, types of events. If they don't know about this, how will they learn about every old animal that's living in the ponds or lakes or ocean? This right here is a medium that, you know, is existing with everybody nowadays and with the kids. I got a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old that, you know, we're fighting the screens all day long. And so, you know, to get them out here and to get them a part of something like this, having them run around here is, is great. You know, it's good for them to get out and see what it's all about. Uh, you know, pulls them away from the phone, right? They're outside enjoying the day and uh, you know, hopefully I have appreciation for it to uh, save it for future generations. Every animal that if they have, if they eat the trash, they'll become extinct. We won't have any animals to take care of or have fish. So we have to keep on planting trees to save the environment. It's something we all have to consider about. It's, it's, uh, we want to be a part of the solution to global warming. We, we want this lake to be here 200 years from now for the fishing derby that goes on then. But we couldn't put this event together without the help of our wonderful carpenters. The Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters and our local 839, these men and women really are the ones that put this entire event together. They not only judge the fish, they measure the fish, they even kiss the fish if they have to. This year you didn't put lipstick on it at least. I hope my boss is going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> so I put it out there, when they pass $500, I would kiss a catfish. Well, then all of a sudden people were hungry for hot dogs. They passed $500. These men are, and women are just phenomenal in putting this event together for us. It's just a wonderful, wonderful event for Hoffman Estates. This is wonderful to be able to come out here as a father and daughter event to come here to do this. We lost the, uh, the hook and there was a nice fellow up here who had an extra hook. Turns out his daughter, sitting down there, is also named Brinley. You can see the two of them down here now bonding together. Uh, that other little Brinley sitting down there, she won. She got the biggest, she got a 19-inch bass. It started to reel and I noticed that this was going to be a big fish because it was very hard to reel in. Leader. My dad had to grab a net to get the fish out of the water. And as soon as we turned it in, I realized that I had the biggest fish. It's really quiet and it has a really peaceful like place. We talk and we mostly like watch the like water and then if we catch a fish we get excited. <laughs> now instead of my uncle or my dad teaching me how to fish, 
Now I'm teaching my son how to fish, especially now with technology, cell phones, tablets, computers, and TVs. I try my best to spend moments with my son. When you're at that weigh-in tent, when these fish come up, it is a good feeling to see the smile on the face of a child for that moment. Nothing else matters. That is what these kind of events are for. The part I owe this community and any community where I'm in is that we take care of our people and everybody has a good time. It's, it's just wonderful to be a part of this. You know, even when I retire, I want to come back to this every year. No peeking. They're getting kids ready to be able to be in the real world. And, and the distinction is, is, is small, but it's, it's really, really important. The all new Skill Saw Heavy Duty Worm Drive Table Saw with Stand. The world's only full size table saw with worm drive gearing. Delivering unmatched durability, unwavering power, and unrivaled torque. So you get better results, faster. Nothing compares to worm drive gearing. Skill saw, stay true. No matter the challenge you're facing on your job site, rely on Ardex for a system of solutions. Leading the way in the tiling and flooring industry, Ardex has followed its vision to be the leader of specialty building materials for 40 years. When you require exceptional performance, when you need trusted solutions, Ardex is up for the challenge. Meet the new family of Blaze Laser Measures from Bosch. Go ahead, turn it on and start measuring. It's that simple. The Blaze family offers a wide range of functions to tackle any measuring job. Extend your reach with accuracy up to a 16th of an inch. With Bluetooth enabled devices, easily transfer measurements to your smartphone or tablet with free Bosch apps. Reach farther, work faster, and stay accurate with the Bosch Blaze family of laser measures. Measure on. The trades are always striving to lift up their communities. For almost a century, Easter Seals has been working to support people living with disabilities and their families. And the carpenters have their back. One, two, three, four, five. What do you say? Bingo. Here in Chicagoland, Easter Seals primarily serves in the form of early childhood programs and programs for those living with autism spectrum disorder. So a lot of our students might have some difficulties with you know, social interactions, how to greet people, how to say hello. Many of these kids cannot be placed in regular classrooms. The reality is it's, it's, it's a full-time job to help a kid with that type of needs. And the fact that Easter Seals is here gives the parents some relief. They're not just caretakers, they're, they're a school. No peeking. They're getting kids ready to be able to be in the real world. And, and the distinction is, is, is small, but it's, it's really, really important. In fact, we really consider ourselves a major success if we can get the child back to their home school, their home classroom. We serve 33,000 people in the Chicagoland and Rockford region at 10 locations throughout those areas. We started in Chicago in 1936. It was always our dream to have our own specialized school where we could build from the ground up because these kids that we're serving uh, with autism, they have hypersensitivities to certain things, light, sound, window placement. So the school was designed with that in mind. When we built the school uh, and opened it in 2008, it was, right, it was to be done in several phases. The first phase would be the school, the specialized school with the lighting, the soundproofing, etc. And the second part was this comprehensive fitness center. The Great Recession impacted on that plan, so we got we were delayed about five, four or five years. They're bursting at the seams. When you see the teachers exercising the kids, it, it really adds something to understand what you're doing out here. Roughly about two years ago, our board of directors said we can't wait any longer. These kids need this service. Finally, we're able to start construction this past year. There was a silver lining in this delay. It allowed us to design a track uh, that we didn't initially have, a full-size basketball court, a bank with facilities that weren't necessarily in the first phase. This fitness center up on the second level, all throughout the design process, Easter Seals could say we want a kid 
kids ready for adulthood and for living in the real world. Adaptive PE for specialized needs kids is so very important. It's hugely important from a curriculum standpoint. It's also important for building friendships and social skills. It's adaptive therapy for physical fitness, but what they're trying to do is incorporate more mainstream activities for the kids so that they have a better opportunity in life when they get out of Easter Seals. If you see the difference in their behaviors when they're in an adaptive physical education program versus walking the halls, which you're doing here at this current time, it's dramatically different. It's a pretty cool project to be able to provide a new environment for kids that really desperately need it. But let me tell you also about these carpenters. We saw it in phase one, and we, we're seeing it now. There's a true labor of love. You can tell that they're, they're adopting these kids. I've been involved long enough to see progression of some of these kids um, you know, in my seven years of involvement with Easter Seals. From day one, they were very, very supportive of this project and uh, very responsive, and particularly responsive to the needs of the kids. My neighbor's son has autism and uh, it, it feels really good to, to help out. Working out here, I get to see a lot of those kids and I see myself as if I was one of their parents. They've all gone through autism sensitivity training so that they understand what our children really, who they really are and the deficits that they have and also the abilities and strengths that they have as well. I think our students have really been um, interested in what's been going on outside the windows of their school and their classrooms. Um, I know that some of my students look out the window all the time just to watch um, some of the workers working. Our classroom goes out and does a lot of community walks so we'll get to see the carpenters working and putting stuff together and the students will even mention, I can't wait to play basketball in there, Mr. Mike. I'm excited to see the faculty get excited too. They're there for a lot of reasons. It's going to be a lot easier for them. It's going to be absolutely amazing. I mean, every day, just the uh, possibilities of now and where you can go with the curriculum, the creativity you can use in the classroom. It won't be long now, a few more months and we'll be wrapping things up. The physical and mental stimulation that they're going to gain out of everything that comes with this project is, is pretty awesome. I'm proud of the structures that I built, but this isn't a structure that I'm building. I'm building a new community for, for the students that are here, and, and that's going to make me more proud than any other project that I've done, and probably any project that I will do. That's all for this episode of Built to Last. And remember to check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And remember, we're always strongest when we come together. What a lovely parting thought, Mark. I've been fishing for that compliment all season. I got one. No, you didn't.